Yesterday, severe storms popped up across the Texas Panhandle and western Oklahoma. Those tracked down towards the Red River Valley, and we received several reports of tornadoes. This goes back to yesterday about midday. A lot of early activity in Colorado and Kansas. There's our first batch of storms there just north of Altus, and you're going to see another get started up there in the panhandles. By late afternoon, we've got this one complex here that produced several tornadoes, and another storm up there near Perryton, Texas, produced a touchdown in the northern part of the city, and some damage was reported up there. As we headed into the evening, the storms kind of lined out. They appeared a lot more outflowish, but they continued to take a path southeast into parts of East Texas, Jacksonville, Tyler, and a stormy night up there in central Oklahoma. Well, we've got a much different picture today. Clear skies in much of the southern plains. The only storms we're seeing are way down to the south in the central Texas region. So what changed? Let's take a look at the upper air charts and explore. So we're looking at some forecast graphics for yesterday morning. This is the 700 millibar chart up at about 10,000 feet, and this is generated by AWIPS, which is the same system used by the National Weather Service. We see a plot here of winds, heights in black, and temperature in red. There's the 12 degree line heading up towards the panhandles, and back in here you see a change from 12 down to 8. So there's cooling as you go west. So this is about 7 in the morning. And as we roll this forward, you're going to see this area of cyclonic curvature in the wind flow and the cooler temperatures moving into the panhandles. So by evening, it's already traversed the panhandles and moved into western Oklahoma. So that rep represents an upper level disturbance moving across that area. Now, if we go to this morning, we don't see any upstream disturbance. It's fairly ridged out. If you look at the wind flow, it has a slight anticyclonic curve. So this is all an area of medium scale ridging. So we don't really have any dynamics to work on the atmosphere, but the temperature profile looks pretty similar. The 12 degree line running through the I-40 corridor. This is a similar chart we use as a sort of cheat sheet. This is the 500 millibar heights and vorticity. So we're going back to yesterday morning once again. You can look upstream there in New Mexico, and we see some thermal troughing at 500 millibars. We also see vorticity maxes out to the west. Now, the patterns here are a little bit noisy. The GFS tends to, ca to capture a lot of small-scale detail due to the very rough terrain in that region. So the gravity waves get kind of merged with the actual dynamic waves, but you do see that rough appearance out to the west, and we can see the troughing in the height contours. But if you compare that to this morning, fast forward 24 hours, well, we've got ridging. It's all ridged out. We don't see much in the way of Vortmaxes out to the west, so the dynamics are a lot weaker. And you can also say in terms of anticyclonic dynamics that they're stronger. So I don't know if we've made you a severe weather expert in two minutes, but that'll give you some background to work with as we go through these charts during future events. Anyway, let's head to the current surface chart. For today, we see an active pattern continues in the Rockies. Lots of 40s, 50s, and 60s showing up in the central part of that mountain range. An active cold front from Nebraska down through southern Colorado and into the Four Corners area. You can see a huge difference between 100 degrees at Phoenix and 74 at Las Vegas. Typically, we should see Las Vegas within about 5 to 7 degrees of Phoenix, but we don't have that today. That's a definite indicator of thunderstorm outflow or cold air originating from a northern latitude. Also, a kind of wavy dry line extending from about Russell, Kansas, down to Childress and Del Rio. Behind that, 
Dew points in the 40s and 50s and temperatures up to 104 at San Angelo. East of that, 70s dew points. In fact, 77 there at Tyler, 78 at Houston. Some very muggy air in that part of the country and a little bit of a reduction in thunderstorm coverage. Out to the east, though, a series of quasi-geostrophic disturbances. Frontal systems out there from Virginia down to Tennessee and a little band of wildfire smoke barely showing up, not really seeing any visibility restrictions, but definitely evident on satellite imagery. So it may be kind of a elevated layer of smoke. So let's head to the northeast. Certainly a rainy pattern this afternoon. You can see cyclonic flow in western New York and northern Pennsylvania. And I think we saw something similar to this back on Monday, a series of systems basically rotating around a larger long-wave trough. Now, the tropical air is mostly down to the south. Let's check out that surface chart real quick. Yep, down there in the Carolinas and Virginia. Looks like Norfolk, Virginia is about as close as it comes. And to the north of that, that looks more like an occlusion. And the chart for this evening at 500 millibars does show it underneath a large trough. Definitely evidence of an upper level low there in northern Pennsylvania and a larger one up in Quebec. And around that, probably a couple of short waves rotating around that trough and producing some of those favorable convective environments helping to get those storms going. Reaching out to the west, so Michigan, the Great Lakes, underneath the influence of anticyclonic flow. And with that, we see a clearing tendency from Lake Huron westward. Further out to the west, yeah, that's that wildfire smoke through Iowa into Kentucky. In the southeastern U.S., scattered storms from the Atlantic down through the central part of Florida, and a separate cluster of storms from the Ozarks down to Mississippi and Alabama. Some of those have produced wind damage. Most of the heaviest storms going on as we record this are in northern Mississippi, and that's close to the center of a SPC slight risk extending from Little Rock and Memphis down to southeastern Alabama. If we take a closer look at that with the Columbus Air Force Base radar, it is a little bit disorganized. The tail end cell near Columbus looks fairly strong. However, looking at the velocity, not really showing any huge rotation, a little bit of outflowish appearance, but the inflow only seems to be indicating about 10 or 15 knots. As we mentioned, things are pretty quiet out there in central Texas. A couple of turkey towers, you can see those anvils detach and disappear, and no initiation on those cells. But further south around, I guess that's Fredericksburg, we do have one cell underway. And that's a look at it on radar. Really not much to write home about. I do kind of wonder if maybe some chasers are out on that storm. But it is interesting when you look out to the west there, lots of gravity waves coming off the mountains. So we do have some dynamics upstream. The models do not seem to be indicating any convection overnight. Just this residual stuff from the daytime storms and nothing overnight. The FV3 model, which tends to be a little bit more aggressive. Let's see here. Yeah, it's not going for anything either. But if we look at the upper airfields, the 500 millibar heights and vorticity does show a little bit of disturbed weather out there in West Texas. This is probably one night where I would consider the possibility of surprise convection. Although, as we've seen, the models are pretty firmly against that. In the north central U.S., stormy in Colorado, just about all corners of the state, and that area is under a SPC slight risk. There's additional storms out there in Nebraska, but they're not really doing very much. There's a closer look at Colorado with the one-minute GO-16 imagery. That's going to be the state line. This here is the Colorado-Kansas state line, and this is going to be around La Junta, Colorado. An isolated storm, quite strong, and another cell further up north. I guess that would be around Eads. No, that's further north. That's probably up there near Burlington or Lyman. And there's a look at those two strong cells 
This one definitely looks super cellular. There's a hook echo right there. That's right along this highway coming out of La Junta, so definitely some good photo opportunities on that storm. And then further north, there's the other cell. Looks smaller, a little bit more like a hailstorm, and that's just south of Interstate 70. The southwestern U.S., well, cyclonic disturbance there in southern Utah. It is windy in southern Nevada with that cold air advection working southward. Clear skies across much of California. Looks like some thunderstorms in the southern parts of the Sierras and also out there east of Riverside. And let's head up north. Just a little bit of fair weather. Most of the clouds and showers are in the mountains around uh, Idaho and Montana, but another weather system approaching, and that'll bring big changes as we get into Sunday and Monday. The surface chart does show a cold front working into Washington and Alberta, temperatures down into the 60s in that region, then heading up north, a long fetch of Pacific air moving onshore into British Columbia and southeastern Alaska, and with that, some wet weather out around Juneau and Ketchikan. Up north, it's been a bit of a return to summer. Temperatures up into the 70s. And that pattern will persist until Sunday or Monday. Then we're going to see a return back to cold weather for at least a week. Heading out east into Canada, cold and temperatures are about what we would expect this time of year. Most of the precipitation is rain. And dropping down into the prairies, Mild conditions, temperatures in the 60s and 70s, and the same story as we go into Quebec and Ontario. So let's talk about that change that's coming, and we do have to return to the 500 millibar chart, because this is kind of like the game plan for the weather. And you're going to watch this area in southeastern Alaska. You notice that region is stormy this afternoon, and we see this low-pressure area dropping southeast around Vancouver Island and into Washington by Sunday. And with that, that's going to bring much cooler temperatures and rain. Some areas in the mountains will see snow as we go into Monday and Tuesday. For Sunday, we're going to be seeing a high of 57 at Seattle, which is going to break the record for the coldest afternoon for the date. Portland will see 60 degrees and Spokane, 64 and then as that cold air spreads southeast, it's going to be a cold day on Monday in Idaho and southeastern Oregon. Highs will be in the 60s in the valleys, 50s in the mountains, and nighttime lows below freezing, 32 degrees at McCall, Idaho. Here's how it looks further south on Monday. Got a strong polar front jet from San Francisco up to Montana. Large ridge across Texas and up into the central U.S. And with that ridge, we're going to be seeing some very hot temperatures in Texas. We'll take a look at that shortly. And another trough in the northeastern U.S., so continued mild weather for that part of the country. Going into midweek and into Thursday and Friday, not much change. And in fact, we see a Rex block. This is a big old block. You can see a big ridge built with this cutoff high and a Low pressure area, a cutoff low south of that. And that configuration is what we refer to as a Rex block. And that will lock up the pattern, especially upstream. So we're going to be seeing a prolonged period of stormy and cool weather in the western U.S. And you can see as we go into Friday and Saturday, it does not change. There it is, Sunday. Kind of the same deal there. And finally, we see that low-pressure area migrate westward. Of course, we're getting pretty far out there, 210 hours. This is the 25th of June, but some strong ridging in the southwestern U.S., so it looks very hot from the panhandles down to New Mexico. And here's where we can see the heat build. This is going to be tomorrow. These are high temperatures, a rather pleasant 70 degrees at Denver, but down there in Texas, 107 at Del Rio. For Sunday, even warmer, 112 at Laredo. Monday, it gets worse. 112 at Del Rio, 113 at Laredo, and 105 at San Antonio. Tuesday, 
Same situation, maybe a few points warmer. Wednesday starts to back off a little bit, and there's the situation on Thursday. But also some warm weather up to the north, 91 there at Minneapolis for Thursday, and 86 at Caribou. And we've also got some developments down there in the tropics, a wave coming off of West Africa, and the seven-day outlook does forecast development of that wave. Here's the AWIPS graphics. Starting out this evening, there's a disturbed area off of West Africa, and you can see that develop and close off into a low-pressure center going into tomorrow. Then it kind of migrates westward, kind of takes a course there for the Leeward Islands, and you can see some strong recurvature there going into Saturday and Sunday next week. Now, this is pretty far out. I, I did look at the European model, and it took a very similar track. But this is pretty far out. So we're going to reevaluate this as we get into next week. And there's a good chance that we'll see some change in the forecast track. Now, one other thing worth pointing out is in the Gulf, it is going to be a little bit unsettled. You remember that large upper-level low that kind of swung southwest into the Gulf, and this is going to be the surface reflection, a little bit of development there out there in the Gulf, and that kind of migrates westward. So that'll be something that we'll keep an eye on as we get into the middle and end of next week. And before we close, one last look at that storm southwest of La Junta, Colorado, shows it moving east and does have a tornado warning on that. So it does still look supercellular, and it's tracking mostly through empty rangeland. But I'm sure the chasers out there are getting a bit of a show. And that's all I've got for this edition of Forecast Lab. Hope you have a great weekend. Thanks to our Patreon supporters, Bob Little, Barbara Little, Thomas Jagger, and our many other supporters. I greatly appreciate that. I'm going to leave you with some footage once again from Greg taken in the Texas Hill Country back on, I think that was on Tuesday, it was a few days ago, but some very scenic vistas. So we'll see you back here on Monday for the supporters for the live show, and everybody else will see you back here on Wednesday. Take care. Bye-bye.